uh, dear friends, uh, welcome to our seminar. So it is my a thesis on splitting methods for modern operators, which is, uh, yeah. And now a very hot topic in optimization in the prime mathematics. And uh, so after PhD, Jonathan uh, yeah, moved to, to Harvard and he was employed in a, in a company working on AI and, uh, and uh, some, some other important uh, hot topics. And uh, then he moved to Rutgers where he was assistant professor and associate professor and uh, since uh, 2004, yeah, where he's a full professor and working in the department of uh, management science and uh, yeah, very much on topics like optimization and operational research. So Jonathan uh, yeah, has a, a interest in uh, uh, yeah, theoretical, but also applied optimization. He is, uh, one of the of the scientists who very much developed a modern and uh, topic like ADMM operator splitting and uh, yeah it is our pleasure to have him today in our seminar so I guess that the topic today Jonathan, will be related yeah, to, to operator splitting yeah, but also to stochastic programming yeah okay so yeah, 45 so minutes I, okay Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, the operator splitting, uh, basically intersection of operator splitting and um, and stochastic programming. Uh, so some of the algorithms, some of the newer algorithms I'll be talking about are from some joint work with Patrick Combet, who was at that time in in Paris Six, but uh, is now or now or one of the Parises anyway. Now it's North Carolina State, and then. Uh, the stuff at the very end, um, some of the computational work is some stuff I've, on stochastic programs uh, with John Paul Watson from Lawrence Livermore National Lab in California and David Woodruff from U California Davis. Um, this stuff is pretty preliminary, so I didn't I didn't end up having all the computational results I really want to show you, but I do have some, and I do have the million scenario problem. I do have something on that. So, okay, uh, okay, so. Um, so uh, I should actually add to this. So the applications that kind of made ADMM hot were ones I didn't really know about when I wrote my thesis. So they're, they're machine learning, they're image processing. Um, and also I should say here, um, I had some slides earlier that I deleted because uh, this, th this presentation is already over long, but, um, and, ADM, the idea of ADMM and operator splitting really has its roots in the, in the differential equation community and in, in the PDE community, okay? Uh, so that's another application, but you know, there hasn't been much work on sort of operations research style applications uh, for optimization problems. I mean, I did some of that work in my dissertation. I didn't get very encouraging results. So, um, but there is one exception, which is in stochastic programming. Um, and so the idea of, of solving, you know, complicated linear programs, things like that over an unfolding uh, tree of random future scenarios. And the big, the big established algorithm in this area is, is Rockefeller and Wett's progressive hedging algorithm, which was published in 1991. Um, though it's, uh, I think the working paper goes, I've seen this goes back to 87. Uh, so I'm going to just talk about, that's a lot of algorithm, a lot of people actually don't know that well, so I'm going to spend a little time explaining that, okay? So uh, they knew, Rockefeller and Wetz knew their algorithm was in fact Douglas Ratchford splitting, okay? Um, but that wasn't a very well-known thing in the OR community, you know, in 1987, so the, the, the paper that introduces it uh, uh, presents it from first principles, okay? Um, and I'm going to present it and then a similar alternative uh, from an operator splitting point of view. So I'm going to explain it by way of the ADMM 
And then I'm going to switch to projective splitting to get an algorithm that has potential to be asynchronous. Okay, so a little um, a little background here. So this is sort of the standard problem that gets solved in stochastic program. It may not be the the underlying right problem, but the standard problem that gets solved is you have a bunch of time stages. I'll call them one to t, and you have a tree of scenarios that unfolds. Okay. Um, and with some probabilities, okay. Um, and let's let's say that at the at the leaves of the tree that there are n of them, um, okay, indexed by i and pi i is your probability. But we actually have a probabilities here, conditional probabilities here in each of these branchings, okay. And in reality, this is probably some discrete time and then sampled approximation to some real underlying problem you'd like you want to solve, but from a from a math programming point of view, we'll we'll kind of fix on this um, kind of image. Okay, so the idea is that at each of these nodes, you have to make some decisions, like how much of investment to buy or sell, how much to run a power generator or whatever, or how much to draw down from a hydroelectric reservoir, and then and then you make those decisions, and then the system randomly walks down to one of from the node you're at to one of its children. Okay, and then maybe you make some more decisions, but those decisions are constrained by what node you ended up at and what decisions you made at the previous stages and so forth. Okay. And so you you walk down randomly from the root to one of these nodes, alternating decisions with uncertainty resolution. Okay, like do I go here or do I go there? Okay. Now this is the problem formula. This is the version of the problem formulation that Rockefeller and Wetz came up with. You know, perhaps not exactly the same notation. So the way we're going to deal with this, both in ADMM and the newer algorithm I'm going to show you, is that we replicate the decision variables. Okay. So we, if n is the number of last stage scenarios, so the number of leaves. Okay. I just make n copies of the variables at every stage. Okay, and I'll let you know x sub i s here indicate the vector of decision variables for scenario i at stage s. Okay, let x i be all the variables for stage i. So this is kind of like if you knew at the beginning that you were going to end up at this leaf. Okay, then these would all, you would just set these variables. Okay, perfectly for that scenario, and you'd be done. Okay, so let's we'll let that be x i in this space script x i. Okay, and then I'll let capital X, you know, I'll let this big script X with no, no subscript be all these variables with lots of replications. Okay, so they consist of, you know, this is for n scenario one, that's for n scenario n, and, and this is for scenario one, that's for stage one, blah, 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 all the way to the last stage. Okay, so the, we've, we've almost kind of doubled our variables here or something, but. Um, now, well, actually uh, multiplied by t, basically. Then, um, actually, it depends on the radix of the tree, how, many, how much you've increased it. Okay, so now, um, and now I'll just consider another space, which is everything the same, except I just forget the last stage. Okay, so I just, I'll call this z. Okay, so this script zi is the space of variable, same space of variables you have for n scenario i, but just I drop the last the last stage, and then this capital Z is the set of all of those. Okay, so it's really just the same space except I forgot the last stage. Okay, and now this is this uh, a word that uh, Rockefeller and Wetz inflicted on the English language: non-anticipativity. It's incredibly hard to say. Okay, but the idea there is a linear subspace of this Z. Okay, that is defined in the following way. Okay, that if you have two nodes, I mean, you have two scenarios here, and, and if they're not, if they're indistinguishable at a certain stage, then they have to have the same decision values. Okay, so for instance, here at the first stage, there's actually only one node in the decision tree, which we replicated out into n. So we say, okay, all those guys have to have the same value. Okay, all the, the, these vectors that you have at each of these nodes have to be all the same. Okay, and say here, okay, 
in this very small tree, uh, you know, at stage two, um, you know, these two scenarios are not distinguishable yet at stage two. So these two nodes, the vectors have to have the same value. Same for these, same for these, okay? So this is a linear subspace and it's called, it's called non-anticipativity. In other words, you're not allowed to see the future. And we call it this script N, okay? And then to get exactly the algorithm that Rockefeller and Wetz have, okay, um, we need to, we use the following special inner product and that's why I kept these spaces kind of abstract instead of calling them, you know, RN or whatever. Um, we're gonna use this particular inner product, which is kind of like the usual canonical one, except that you multiply by the probability of that last stage scenario. Okay. And then um, if you use that inner product, the map that projects from Z, okay, so everything, all these replicated variables, just not including the last stage, the, that the project from that onto the non-anticipativity subspace works like this. You take, um, at each stage, you take all the nodes that, you know, take all the nodes that you're not distinguishable from it. You take all the scenarios you're not distinguishable from yet, okay? And you just take the probability weighted average of those vectors, okay? So like here, these two aren't distinguishable, Okay, so um, what you should do, if you have different vectors at this point, you take a weighted average of them weighted by the probability of these two scenarios, okay? And here at the top, everything is, you know, nothing's distinguishable. All these guys have to have the same value, okay? So you just take, you take, just take their average of these vectors, but weighted by the probability of the, of the scenarios that they correspond to, okay? Okay, so, so far, all I've just shown is just standard Rockefeller West 1991, okay? Um, they go through a first principles derivation. Um, this is an ADMM derivation, you get the same algorithm, okay? So, so the notation I'm gonna use for ADMM is just, you can be a little bit more complicated here if you want, but um, just, okay, so from X, I have some convex function little f that can be plus infinity. From z, I have some convex function g that can be plus infinity, okay? And I have some linear map from x to z, and I consider this problem, minimize f of x plus g of mx, which is equivalent to minimize f of x plus g of z, subject to mx equals z. And then the ADMM for that looks like this thing, okay? So you minimize the augmented Lagrangian with respect to f, I mean, with respect to X with Z held constant, then you minimize it with respect to Z with X held constant at the previous value. And then you, even though this doesn't come anywhere close to minimizing your augmented Lagrangian, I still do the update I would not do in an augmented Lagrangian with these multipliers W, okay? I just, and rho is, is the penalty parameter for the augmented Lagrangian, which is supposed to be fixed in ADMM unless you get pretty hairy. Okay, so that's the ADMM. And if we now set things up in the following way, okay? So I'm gonna let F sub I, okay, be this, okay, so I'm gonna give it all the variables for scenario I, but going up to the root, including all these replicated variables, okay? Okay, I'm gonna let that be the following. I'm gonna let it be pi I, the probability of scenario i times this h of i, where h of i is like the is like the cost function for scenario i, and plus infinity if you violated any constraints for scenario i. Okay, so any coupling constraint, any constraint at any at any of those nodes, anything, if you violate that, you're plus infinity. Otherwise, it's the cost. Okay, and I just multiply that by the probability of scenario, and then this mapping m sub i from the scenario i variables, you know, to the scenario i variables without the last stage is the obvious thing you would use. It's just the linear map that drops the last stage variables, okay? And then this problem, so minimize the sum of the fi's subject to m1 times x1, m2 times x2, blah, 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 m n times xn, this compound vector being in the non-anticipativity non subspace, okay? That is the stochastic program, okay? You solve that, you solve the stochastic program. 
Okay, so we can just plug that into ADMM. Okay, I'll just let my f function of ADMM be the sum of these little fi. So this is a this is a separable function by scenario. G is just the indicator of this non-anticipativity subspace. So it gives me zero if I'm on the subspace, otherwise plus infinity. And this linear map M is just the one that drops the last scenario. So I give it one of these big replicated vectors, which has you know all the all the vec all the decision vectors in the problem replicated at, for every time stage, okay, for every scenario. And I just drop the last scenario, last time stage for each one. And if you apply the ADMM to that, you get this thing. Okay, so you do a separate. You take the each individual scenario and you do you 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 optimize it as if it were the only as if you knew the future as if you knew who exactly which scenario is going to happen, but with a linear quadratic perturbation. Okay, and you and you, you a new new uh, vector for every single. Um, scenario, then you project on that thing, on the, you get the new Zs by dropping the last scenario and projecting onto the non-anticipativity subspace, and then you do a standard multiplier update, okay? And it, it so happens that this W is always in the orthogonal complement of this subspace N. And the reason you can see, if it starts that way, you can see that it will stay that way because the difference between a vector, you know, a vector and its projection onto the subspace have to be in the complement. Or if you know Douglas Ratchford splitting, you know that WK should always be in the subgradient of G at ZK in, in, in the ADMM. And this G of ZK, you know, only has subgradients in the in the orthogonal complement. Okay. And this is also because we're here using the indicator function uh, indicator function of subspace, it's also equivalent to this method of spin guard called partial inversion. OK. And then if you write everything out in full detail, you get this. OK, but it's basically the idea of progressive hedging is, OK, you just, for every last stage scenario, you just optimize as if you knew that we're going to be the, the exact future, but with a quadratic perturbation. Then you do a bunch of averaging over scenarios. You update some Lagrange multipliers, and you loop, OK? If you don't use that weighted inner product, if you use the ordinary inner product in Rn, you get a different thing where these are this is a simple average instead of a probability weighted average, but the probabilities pop up here instead. Okay, but it's basically the same algorithm. Okay, so this thing is a decomposition algorithm. Okay. Okay. So and there's lots of algorithms like this in optimization operations research. Um, and they, they have the following form. You solve a bunch of subproblems that are you know, more dealable than the original problem. Like they don't use as much memory, whatever, they have fewer, you know, they solve a bunch of smaller problems. Then you do a coordination step. Then you solve a bunch of smaller problems. Then you do a coordination step, et cetera, okay? Um, and so in any decomposition method, the subproblem computations can be operated in parallel, okay? But the coordination steps can pose a serial bottleneck, okay? In general, not so much in progressive hedging, but talk about that in a second, okay? So um, the nice thing about progressive hedging is that the coordination steps are not something like you get in Danzig Wolf or Bender Seacott, some optimization problem that you have to solve. Okay. It's just a bunch of averages and sums and very simple vector operations. Okay. So the nice thing about progressive hedging is that you don't necessarily have a serial bottleneck because the coordination steps can also be implemented in parallel. Okay. Because going over to, to computer science, there's some very nice algorithms for, you know, parallel processing to, to, you know, compute sums of vectors in parallel or averages of vectors in parallel, okay? So, um, and another thing that I like about progressive hedging is it handles multi-stage problems very cleanly, okay? It doesn't matter if you have a two, you know, if you have a 
eight stage problem as opposed to a two stage problem, your averaging is a little bit more complicated, but the basic structure of the algorithm stays the same. You don't get at these kind of recursive crazy things like you can with say benders or something like that, okay? Uh, a minor thing, the theory works for general convex problems, uh, doesn't require linearity or anything. Um, superficially, it's also very easy to generalize the problem to non-convex and integer. Um, you know, non-convex problems or you know problems that have integer variables or whatever. Although it's somewhat superficial because you lose the standard convergence theory. Okay, so you have more of a heuristic then, but at least you have something. Okay, so progressive hedging was not a huge hit, okay, at the beginning, okay? Convergence speed on practical problems wasn't spectacular, um, but its relative simplicity means that it started to become more popular, say, in the last 10 years or so, because, you know, problems are getting bigger, there's interest in problems with a lot of stages, uh, interest in parallel computing's going up, okay? so sort of about 20 years after it was initially published, progressive hedging started to get used more, okay? So there's this system that uh, PiSP that my collabor you know, collaborators of mine at, at Sandia National Labs, um, basically um, they, that group has a, flat, has a modeling environment, a mathematical optimization modeling environment that's embedded in Python and they sort of built a stochastic programming solver environment on top of that. Okay. And they kind of focused largely on, uh, on uh, progressive hedging because it was nice, easy, relatively easy to implement in that, okay, in that area, in that kind of setup. And uh, there's also been some recent work on making applications of progressive hedging more rigorous when you have integer variables which I, I can't go into here, but there is some work on that now. Okay. Now, one issue with the classic progressive hedging, it's like kind of a classic uh, decomposition method. It's completely synchronous, okay? So in principle, you have to solve every problem at every iteration, okay? And if the subproblems don't take the same amount of time, then you can end up wasting time. So kind of have this schematic here. This is very extreme for typical convex programming, but it's kind of like, okay, we have a bunch of, um, you know, like we saw this processor solves this subproblem and it gets done, but this one takes much longer. So this guy has to wait. And so to varying degrees, all these other ones until the slowest, sub, slowest processor is done with its subproblem, then you can coordinate. Now here the coordination looks parallel because say in progressive hedging, it is something you can kind of do in a parallel cooperative way. It, you know, it's, it's not like solving a, an LP or something that gets quite tricky to solve in a parallel way. Okay. And then same thing, but maybe this subproblem takes the longest. So these ones have idle times and so forth, okay? So you can, because you have to be synchronous, you can lose, um, you can lose some efficiency. Now, one thing you could do to counteract that is to pack multiple subproblems into processors and kind of load balance and so forth. Or there, you could use some advanced bundle methods, which I'm not going to talk about here. Or you can do what I'm going to talk about soon, which is to use a different form of splitting method that's um, that's a little bit more sophisticated than DR, or more complex than more flexible than DR and ADMF. Okay, so that's what I want to talk about now. So now we get into the heavier math. So I'm going to talk about, this is a rather abstract monotone inclusion. So we have some Hilbert spaces, H0 through Hn. I have some on H on Hilbert spaces, one through N. I have some maximal monotone operators, you know, set valued maps. Um, and then these GIs are bounded linear maps from H0 to H1, H2, H, et cetera, okay? And we define this thing, which is called either the primal dual solution set or the Kuhn-Tucker set or various things, but it's this particular, um, it's a set of vectors in H0 cross H1 cross blah, 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 cross Hn, such, okay, so we have the Zs and the Ws. Wi is in Ti of GIZ for each i, and then the sum of GI adjoint WI, okay, equals zero, okay? 
And it doesn't, it does, you can stare at this a little while, you realize if I have a point, okay, in this set, if I have a point Z, W in this point, then Z is actually a solution of this problem. It's, not, it's pretty easy to see that, okay? And furthermore, and I'm not going to go into details, there are various proofs of this, but it turns out this is a closed convex set. And we can, uh, now one thing that kind of defines a closed convex set is it's, it's kind of defined by the separators that it has. Okay. It is exactly the intersection of all the linear half spaces, closed linear half spaces that contain it, okay? So here's a way to get such a half space, okay? If I take any x i y i in Hilbert space i, such that y i is in t i of x, so this is called x i y i being the graph of t i. If I have any such point, okay, and I um, and then a point in this target set S, the solution primal dual solution set S, okay. So these guys are in the graph of t i, and then w i is also in t i of g i. W i is in T i of G i z for all i. So just the definition of monotonicity says, okay, this inner product has to be non-negative, okay? The differences of x and G i z, differences of y and w. Okay? So if I negate all those guys and add them up, I get this inequality. It says any z w, if I pick these x i's kind of as fixed points in, in the graphs of the T i's, any point in this target set at, you know, this target primal dual solution set must be on the less than or equal to zero, you know, must satisfy this inequality. Now I've drawn this here, like this is an affine inequality. And it may be, you're wondering, is that really affine? Because I have cross, you know, the arguments are Z and W and I have cross terms here between the Z's and the W's, okay? And that's, however, if you're careful, and there's a, several different techniques you can use, but with a little care, we can make these affine. So the, the technique I'm gonna use here, and there's several others, but the technique I'm gonna use here is just say, look, I'm gonna restrict my whole algorithm to this space V, okay, which consists of H naught, and then points W equals W1, WN, okay, such that this, these linear equations are true, okay? Now this clearly contains the target set, okay? And as long as you stay in that subspace, that inequality will be affine because it's quite easy to see that all the quadratic terms just cancel out, okay? And, and the various techniques all that for this, making sure these inequalities are affine are all like that in one way or another, okay? But once we know this thing is affine, okay, then projecting onto it is a very easy task. And so we can use this following kind of very generic algorithm, okay? From used in many, many places, okay? So um, what you can do, so here's the following thing. I just have some Hilbert space V and I have some closed convex set S, okay? And I have some way of finding separators for that set. Okay, I have some way of finding uh, affine inequalities that are valid for that set, okay? So I can imagine the following just generic algorithm framework, okay? So given up some point PK in the space, okay? I choose some affine function such that the target sets on the you know, non-positive side of this um, affine function and hopefully, not necessarily, but hopefully the current iterates on the positive side, okay? And then I just project onto this half space given by this. I project onto that, and maybe I do some over relaxation by a factor, you know, that's bounded away from zero and two. That gives me a new point, okay? Then I find another half space, I project onto that, maybe with some over relaxation, I keep going, okay? And in the context of the particular space and the particular separators that I was talking about, okay, uh, that 
this generic algorithm would now play out like this, okay? I, for each, I, I find my separator function phi k by picking some x i y i i's in the graphs of these operators, okay? Okay? And then I, the projection actually looks the following. I compute this u, which is just the projection of the x's onto this space w that I think I'm living in. The v, I project, compute this v, and which is the sum of gi stars times the yi's, okay? These things, this u and vk together are basically the normal, okay, to the to the um, to the subspace where you know or the the subspace the half space boundary we're projecting on. I compute the basically compute the squared norm of this uh, maybe with this optional scaling factor here um, for kind of between the primals and the duals. If I get zero, then it basically means I I have a solution already. Okay. If, I, if I don't get zero, then I basically, uh, I compute a step length. And then, and you can see that the degree of violation of the, the, in, the affine inequality I picked appears here in the step length. And then I make a, a, a primal step and a dual step. Okay. So this may look sort of complicated, but rather than worrying about the details, it's just, Basically, it's how this very generic algorithm for trying to converge to a point in a, in a convex set, that's how it plays out with this particular, in this particular space and with this particular choice of separator, okay? It's still a very, when I say particular choice of separator, it's still very general, okay? But, okay. So the question is, okay, this is something you could do, okay? But how do you pick these x i y i's in the graphs of the ts? Like how, how how do you know which one to pick? Okay, if you pick them a totally arbitrarily, you won't converge. You'll just orbit. Okay, I mean you won't get any farther from the solution set, but you won't necessarily converge to it either. So it turns out one thing you can do is the is the prox operation. Okay, so. Now I write this prox with a capital P, which is kind of not standard, but basically I take this specific quantity here and I just apply the resolvent of Ti to it with some step size Cik. And then I can, I can kind of compute a matching Y here, but the idea, but the basically um, this, this is kind of like the prox of the, of the inverse of the, the Y is actually essentially a prox of the inverse of the operator. So if you do this, you get the following linear equality, following linear vector equality, and actually will actually show you that the, that each of these terms in this sum given by this affine inequality, each of them will be non-negative because it's just, it, they're, they're, it's equal to a, um, you know, the norm squared of, of, it's of two particular vectors with two particular, different scalings, okay? So this says, okay, so if I basically do that, do this prox operation for every single operator, I know um, I'll get something that cuts off the current iterate, okay? I mean, it might be zero if I'm already in the space, I've already have a solution, but basically it should cut off the current iterate. And then <clears throat> this gets into a lot of details, but you can prove that this guarantees weak convergence, okay? To, to the space, to the target set. If the uh, step sizes that are used in the prox operations are bounded away from zero and bounded away from infinity, okay? Um, and, you know, in finite dimensional space, that's convergence, okay? Now, there are several variations that one can do, okay? So you don't have to act it. So this is in the paper I wrote with, with Patrick Combet in came out in 2018. Um, you don't have to evaluate every operator every time, okay? What you can do is the following, okay? So if we have some, let's just let M be any non-negative integer, okay? And at each iteration, okay, I pick some subset I sub K of the, of the operators to, to prox, okay? 
And I just have this thing that comes from like um, uh, feasibility algorithms for finding intersections of lots of convex sets. But I have this, uh, this thing that says just, okay, in every capital M iterations, I look at each operator at least once, okay? But this M can be much larger than N, okay? And then the trick is, okay, for the operators I've picked, okay, I, I do this calculation I showed in the previous slide, the other ones, I just recycle what I had the previous iteration. That's still in the graph of the operator. And it turns out that that's enough. You can use, kind of borrow some ideas from, from successive projection methods and show you, oh, I still get weak convergence, even if I'm lazy, you know, like I could just go round robin and just pick one operator each time, okay? Or various other rules, who knows, okay? And then the final thing that we need here is you can also have lag. So in that same uh, procedure I just showed, so we proc some of the operators, just not forgetting about them for ever expanding amounts of time, but I proc some of the operators, recycle others. But when I proc some of those operators, I can use like stale information. I can use you know, the Zs and Ws from the algorithm from a few, you know, some, number of iterations ago, so long as there's some bound capital K on how stale they are. Okay. So I can use stuff, I can, I don't have to do every operator every time, okay? And the ones that I do look at, I can base those prox operations of those operators on, on information that's, that might be somewhat out of date. There just has to be some finite bound, okay? And turns out you still get weak conversions. I, I'm not gonna do the details here. What that allows you to do is to be asynchronous, okay? So combining those two last features gives you an async a potentially asynchronous process, okay? So just imagine for each I, okay, that I, uh, that some, this prox operation just happens at least once every T1 time units based on some the central algorithm data that are at most T2 time units old, okay? And then some one of these projection steps occurs every T3 time units based on uh, X, X, you know, based on data here, they're at most T4 time units old, okay? And you still get weak convergence now over time, okay? And here's kind of a picture like, okay, this one gets proxed here and here, this one gets proxed over here, this one gets proxed there, okay? And these gray lines are kind of, like indicating when I combined, when I did a coordination step. Okay. But you can effectively kind of run a, de a decomposition, you know, run the, look at the sub problems on some, on some asynchronous schedule, do the coordination on some asynchronous schedule, and, and you don't even have to like match them up carefully. Okay. So now to apply stochastic, to apply this algorithm to stochastic programming, you can use the following setup, okay? I'll let H naught, the, the sort of the primal, um, sub, the primal Hilbert space, I'll just let that be the non-anticipativity substance. The HIs will be the ZI, so each, each scenario, okay, dropping the last, um, dropping the last stage, okay? The GI, the, the linear maps are just select from the non-anticipativity sub, they just select the, the vector that's, um, that's uh, appropriate for scenario I. And okay, so, and then I'll let this function FI of X tilde I, this X tilde is meaning to indicate that I'm dropping the last stage. What I do is, I just have that same function for the individual scenarios in infinity if it violates any scenario constraints, okay? Multiply by the probability and I just minimize over the last stage, okay? And then the stochastic program with this setup just becomes a sum of, just a sum of a bunch of convex functions applied to some vector with, you know, with a different linear operator here, okay? And under some regularity assumptions, this is equivalent to this same problem formulation I showed earlier. Okay. So 
Um, there's some technicalities here, like you, you know, to get the functions to be closed, you need the domains of the H's to be compact and you, you know, some, some technical assumptions here, which at least this one isn't too hard to satisfy in practice. But based on that, you get the same, uh, you get that this is the same as the stochastic program. And then if you apply this method, okay, you apply this uh, projective splitting method, this asynchronous projective splitting method, you get the following, okay? The subproblems look like this, okay? I get to pick now, um, I have some upper and lower bounds on the penalty parameter, but you, you get things that look almost exactly like the subproblem solved by projective, by progressive hedging, okay? You know, you do this, you, you solve a, a linear quadratic perturbation of the individual scenario, um, but you get to pick the penalty parameter separately for each guy, if, if for each scenario, if you want, uh, just within some bounds. And you do something that looks kind of like the part of the multiplier update, and that's your result. And that you get your xi, x tilde i, y i that way. Okay. So it looks like what you get in in um, like the ADMM or or pH. Okay. Okay. The coordination process looks like this. Okay. The Zs live in the non-anticipativity subspace. The Ws, it turns out, live in the orthogonal complement, just like they do in, in progressive hedging. Um, you have these additional two variables, x tilde and y, that live in the non-anticipativity subspace, I live in this Z, okay? This just with the last variables dropped, last stage dropped. We also compute these step directions at each stage. Turns out the Us are in N, orthogonal complement of non-anticipativity, these are in non, okay, we have some other parameters and we get this thing which looks a little complicated, okay? But okay, you pick up some X tilde I, Y, I, okay? Which are, you know, solutions from the subproblems. You project the X tildes onto the orthogonal complement of this subspace N, project the Vs onto the subspace N, you compute some norms and inner products and, um, you do a step, okay? So now this is not necessarily a central master process, okay? These things are all basically just averaging and simple vector operations. So they actually could be distributed over multiple processors, okay? And then within that, we can get exactly the same asynchronous. Exactly the same as you know. So every subproblem just gets solved once in some specific time time period. You run the coordination once every specific amount of time, and you know at least once every you know specific interval of time. And you you know the lags between communicating and communicating between the two are bounded, and you you basically get a a progressive hedging like thing that's potentially asynchronous. And we call this asynchronous projective hedging. Um, it has this very same sub, very similar subproblems. The coordination step is more complicated, but made up of similar operations, none of which are more complicated than projection onto n. Okay, but now it's asynchronous. Okay, the subproblem and the coordination can kind of run at different speeds. They're in in idea in pH, they're locked in that you have to do n subproblem solves for every coordination step. Okay. But now you can be fast, you can have a different ratio. Okay. So running into the end here. So here's a an application. Uh, we generated this SSN telecommunication design problems uh, from Suvarjit Sen. Um, We've generated them with up to a million scenarios, okay? The hardware is this Quartz supercomputer at Lawrence Livermore, and the software is this thing called MPI SPPY, which is quite new, but it's kind of a replacement for Pi SP, okay? So, uh, uh, okay, can I answer your question later, Russell? Yes, we'll do it later, after okay. talk. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. So, but I, so here, 
So the way these supercomputers, for those of you who don't know, you know, they consist of nodes, which usually have two CPU chips on them, could be one, okay? Each of which has multiple cores and some shared memory. So the, every, all the memory here is just shared by multiple cores. And then you have some interconnect that, that connects them all, okay? This particular machine has 32 cores per node, 128 gig of RAM per node, about 3,000 nodes, okay? And then a very fast, dense network that connects everything. But most we've used is 250 nodes, which is 8,000 cores. Um, the software, okay, is uh, it's built ag again on PyAmo uh, that embeds in Python, it's mostly coded in Python, but that's not a big problem because most of the CPU time spent in, in solving the subproblems, which is like uh, typically Garobi uh, or, num or linear algebra kernels that are NumPy and Colder Blast. Um, and they have this hub and spoke architecture, which is not like what you might think. Okay, MPI is just how messages get sent between groups of processors. Um, so the problem is that uh, pH, um, neither pH nor this APH I really have, it neither provides like true upper or lower bounds on your solution, okay? Because um, it doesn't really, uh, you know, it doesn't ever have solutions that are completely feasible and it never um, really exactly minimizes the augmented Lagrangian. So um, it, the kind of idea here, maybe I'll skip ahead because the time is getting a bit low, um, but the idea is this hub process, you know, a rank is a single shared memory space, which in this implementation we're using is typically four CPU cores, which is what Garobi can use efficiently. Um, and you pack maybe say in our case, eight of them onto a node, okay? Each of them is responsible for some fixed set of of scenarios, okay? And um, the idea is this hub, this group of, of ranks here, the hub is responsible for running progressive hedging or APH, okay? The other, you have other stacks that are similar, okay? But they're responsible for computing a lower bound, you know, a, like a dual feasible solution basically, or a primal feasible solution. And there are various techniques for that, but um, I don't wanna, kind of running short on time, so I don't want to get into it. But the idea is that when they communicate information, you're only communicating with another processor that has the same, knows about the same scenarios, okay? So, um, and you can kind of in parallel use the bandwidth of the, of the communication network to send scenarios between processors in parallel, okay? So this is kind of the picture. This is what happens inside the hub cylinder that you know you might have four sub here we have four sub problems per per rank and in the asynchronous case we have this listener that's just sort of asynchronously sending data between these guys okay um, and then the bigger picture might be like this you know progressive hedging or APH is running on this central um, stack here but a lower bounder you know, just computing regular Lagrangian lower bounds is running on this stack, and then maybe some heuristic for finding primal feasible solutions running on that stack, okay? And about all the messages kind of either move synchronously or synchronously within these stacks or in parallel sideways between stacks, okay? Uh, one more point that I wanna move before I get the final computational punchline is that we're actually not using single scenarios here. We're using bundles of like, in our case, a thousand scenarios. But the, so we're kind of grouping the scenarios and then do progressive hedging or asynchronous progressive hedging between them. So here we are, here's the final data, okay? Um, unfortunately, I don't have one for the thing running yet for the thing running truly asynchronously. So in this case, APH, it's the, it's the same, just running in a synchronous mode. We just have one, bundle of a thousand scenarios per, per rank, okay? Two cylinders of 20, so it's a 20,000 scenario problem, each with 160 cores or total of, okay? So it's 160 cores and we can see, and this is, this problem is just the size where we can compute, uh, you know, compute the exact extensive form solution. And you see in like maybe uh, 10 minutes or so, uh, 
we have pretty good solutions, both from progressive hedging and from our new algorithm run in asynchronous mode, but they're a little better from the new algorithm, okay? And this is for a million scenarios, okay? Probably more than you need for this problem. This is for a million scenarios. Um, and so we're running again in synchronous mode. So it's just like everyone, you know, everyone's, every rank solves one sub problem and does a, does a coordination. So it's not really asynchronous yet. It's just a different algorithm. Um, but this, to do this, to do a million scenarios, which is a thousand bundles of a thousand scenarios each, we have to use 8,000 cores, which is 250 nodes. And again, this gap now is to the best known solution as opposed to the, um, the, the true known optimum. But you can see again, it's the new algorithm similar, um, but a little better than progressive hedging. Now, what I'd really hope to show here was a thing where it's actually running asynchronously, but I wasn't able to get that from Dave and JP in time. But just an idea, this million scenario problem, the extensive form has 795 million variables, 265 million constraints and 2.6 billion non-zeros. Okay, so this is not a small problem. Okay, there's a whole much more to do here to actually make this useful for a practical problem, okay, which, which we're working on. Okay, so I think that's my time, right? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Yeah. Nice talk. So let us continue with Rasta's question. Yeah. Thanks. Rasta? Okay, yeah. So, I mean, I'm, what I don't quite have a feeling for, Jonathan, is, is uh, how the mechanism works for the asynchronous implementations. And so I'm trying to think of, you know, right. how I might break it if, if I, if I'm not thinking of, of stale information, but just really information coming from completely different places that I'm trying to combine. Right. So, so why wouldn't that work? Whereas your asynchronous implementations would work or um, maybe it would work. I don't know. I don't know. It, well, the idea is as follows. Okay. So let's take it. So just imagine Okay, like in this picture, you're, sol you're solving individual components, okay, at the, in these colored blocks, right? Now just imagine, say each of those was like a two core computer, okay? And so one core was doing these solves, okay? The other core is doing one of these um, kind of, uh, you know, tree-based um, summing procedures, okay? So there's, you know, it's like, okay, like ev everyone adjacent sums their vectors, okay? Like, like, like all odd, even numbered processors add the vector from the, um, the odd numbered processor next to them. And then all zero mod four processors add from, you know, the one that's two away, et cetera. That's a, that's a you know, log time. That's a nice algorithm for computing vector sums in parallel. That can be done in, an, in, a, in a not completely time, you know, not completely lockstep way. It can, can be kind of done in a loose, loose time way. And which is what this squiggly gray line is trying to depict. Okay, so imagine each of these processors has one core that's just maybe selecting from a stable of subproblems and solving them, and another one that's just running this COM process and updating, you know, updating the Z and the relevant W every time it has a new one. And so basically, as long as you have time bounds on, on how long these process, processes take, okay, you will get it, it, it can be mapped back to a discrete time process like I showed earlier, and then you get convergence. So, so can you translate that time bound on the lags right. to a distance bound on the points from which that information is coming? Yes, yeah, yeah, because, because the underlying process is, is, is basically phasure monotone, okay? I mean, you won't get a convergence rate unless you make additional assumptions. But you basically have a you have a you have a you know an integer index process which is phasure monotone to the to the target set, 
and then you have some unequal time space thing that's mapping to that but you know that the the space between you know events can't be more than some function of those three constants t1 through t4 so you're good i have a lot more i could ask you about that but i'll let other people ask you yeah questions. yeah it's it's a little hard to get your head like, like you're not used to thinking about parallel algorithms. It, it, it's, it's a whole other skill, yeah. I see you're similarly, similarly haircut deprived. <laughs> <laughs> My corona man. <laughs> Thank you, Rasen. Yeah. Are there further questions? Yeah, I know that was a lot. I wasn't quite sure how to, no, what level I, to, you know, I didn't explain I, what monotone operators were and things like that. Anyway. I have a question, John. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, the yeah, the, the algorithm you are you are using is I guess it, it is is the Hogazo algorithm. Is this correct? No, Hogazo is is a is a variation you can do if you want okay. strong. Okay. 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 So the the only the difference in Hogazo, right, is in this it's, picture. Okay. okay. Yeah. You, you, you construct a separator that yes. cuts, you know, has this set on one side and the current iterate on the other okay, side. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. okay. And then you, um, but okay, then yeah. you project the, you know, original point onto mm -hmm. intersection of two hyperplanes, one of which is this new one you've generated. Mm -hmm. And that guarantees strong convergence. Indeed. I haven't heard, I haven't heard that it, in practice, finite dimensionally actually gives you anything better. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it should give you strong convergence to a known point, like a, you know, the point that's closest to the starting point, if that helps you, you know. Yeah, okay. But, you know. So I was, I was confused by the picture. My impression was that you are, okay, but now now I realize that you the are The picture's just, just showing yeah. two iterations. Okay, okay. yes, okay. okay, yeah. My experience with the Ogazo type strategies is that, um, yeah, counterintuitively, it doesn't provide faster conversions, actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it, yeah. it's you're dragging a kind of a ball and chain around. Okay, I have another question. Yeah, we have two, two, two more questions. So, uh, Vincent, uh, yeah, this is first name. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, and, and then Matthias. Okay. Yeah. So, there's no, there's no, the thing is, this is just like progressive hedging in terms of going to multi stage. Okay which is that um, when you, it's just here in, in two stage, this is just a global simple average of vectors, okay? You just have one vector of each scenario, you average, done, okay? If they're multi-stages, you're kind of averaging groups that have different size, mm -hmm. okay? But it's still, it's still just averaging. And in fact, there's a there's something called segmented scans in parallel computing that that would allow you to do this averaging very like basically with one operation, just like different pieces of the vector would would get you know the averaging would be um, kind of non-commutative in a sense, but um, you would you would you could basically do this with with not much more communication than you would for just a two scenario problem and and the communication pattern of the asynchronous is the same, basically. And, and it can be kind of done in these asynchronous, you know, cuts across the process. Okay. Um, I think Thank there you. was another. Matthias? Was there another one? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for the nice talk. And uh, I agree first with Hogazo. Uh, I also didn't experience <laughs> any acceleration. <Yeah. laughs> Thanks to Hogazo. Uh, so that's a good. Uh, that you also have this uh, experience, <laughs> but uh, more related to your talk. So, um, from the perspective of stochastic programming, so you do some sort of a uh, scenario tree construction, and then I wasn't sure exactly how you handled the stochasticity. So, do you use some sample average approximation at the end of the day to about variance? I mean, it's just, uh, no, I mean, I'm not, I'm not doing anything that's like theoretically nice for stuff. I'm, I'm just saying, okay, suppose someone hands us a, um, I mean, I'm just working with a fixed sample of scenarios, basically. Okay. Yeah, so I'm not doing any, 
Uh, All right. Yeah. I'm just, but I'm just saying, okay, given that someone is, you know, but possibly it's a lot of stages, possibly there are a lot of scenarios. Okay. But I, yeah, I'm just taking the same approach as progressive hedging does, which just says, okay, that's given. Okay. All right. All right. All right. I mean, All obviously, right. from the point of view of someone who really is stochastic, there's all sorts of other things you can do with, you know. Yeah, because that would be been my third question, actually, because I was never really sure what the scenario tree approach really buys you in terms of computational efficiency. So I'm usually more used to see stochastic approximation algorithms in an online fashion where you draw right. data freshly at every iteration right. and then yeah. There are different well, questions, how to handle yeah. the noise and I so mean, on and so forth. I mean, the type of problems that my collaborators are really interested in is things like, okay, I would like to plan the electric grid of California, okay, yeah. for the next 48 hours. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And there's some, you know, but it's a very complicated problem, maybe has quite a few stages but you could probably cover it with, you know, a few dozen weather scenarios or something yeah. that you can watch yeah. unfolding. That, that's the kind of target that they have. I see. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you, Matthias. Pat Patrick. Is, yeah, is yeah. I'm just uh, yeah. a word yeah. on the great Ogazor, right? <laughs> <laughs> you have to say it right. You have to say it right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my colleague Ogazo from uh, from Bordeaux, right? Who wrote this thesis okay. in '68. So the the purpose is different, right? I mean, uh, phase Moton sequences give you just if you want any point in a solution set uh, and weakly so in infinite dimension. Whereas Ogazo has different purpose. Ogazo is the best approximation uh, algorithm, right? So it is not designed to go faster. What that means, right? It is designed designed to give you a specific point. And if you are concerned with infinite dimensional uh, applications, control PVs and so on, or optics, uh, you know that you go there strongly as opposed to weak convergence, yes. which infinite dimension does nothing, right? You can just be circling on a ball around the, your solution and doing things. So it's, it's a different purpose, right? It's, but one of them is definitely not to go faster, right? Actually, yeah. if you look at the gazo, right, roughly the projection onto the, the, the half space that uh, uh, Jonathan talked about cannot be extrapolated. So in a way you go in that step size twice as slow, right? So it's yeah, intuitively, it's not designed to go faster. Actually, it's usually slow, right, by, by design, but qualitatively you get something very much different, right? So that's the, the context of Orgazo versus just any uh, feasible point, right? Yeah. I, I'd like to make one, one general comment, okay, that, that this, this algorithm, is like, you know, just this simple separator projection algorithm is like one of the very fundamental tools in our toolbox, okay? So in fact, anything that is, um, any algorithm that gives you like a phasor type monotonicity can be mapped onto this, okay? You know, anything that's firmly non-expansive is giving you a, a separator, okay? Mm -hmm. And therefore you may be, you know, this is sort of a, a basic building block of a lot of the algorithms we already were using. And it's kind of nice to kind of pull it out, separate think, okay, this is the standard, standard building block. And then, you know, there's a whole, um, you know, basically Bernard Spider made a whole industry of different variation, you know, using this idea to look at proximal point algorithms, things like that. So, you know, like solid oven spider, like, okay, um, you know, I do a proc step a, approximately, you know, I do a proc, I don't do an a, exact proc step, but I get a hyperplane that's pretty good and I, and I project exactly onto that and I can still get conversions. So that this is, this thing here is actually some people don't think of it that way, but that's one of our fundamental algorithmic building blocks. Mm -hmm. Matthias? Cool. That's your, oh, yeah. your hand is still hand. up. Okay. Oh, really? So, sorry. No, but okay. I have no question so, anymore. Sorry. <laughs> okay, this is not a question. Okay. Are there further questions? I mean, yeah. I, I want to, to comment on what Patrick said. So, of course, Ogazo is. Uh, yeah, it, it's first of all, it's strongly, strongly convergent. And there are also other methods, Halpern and, and the Tom Tikhonov techniques and so on. 
But the, the point is that it, it is very difficult to, to see the difference between weak and, and strong convergence in applications. I mean, that it is not clear how to emphasize this. Right. Yeah, actually, I, I was wondering about the same thing. I mean, Patrick, this is partly in relation to, to sort of a generalized OGSO method that, that you worked on with Heinz and I guess, I think John Bowen, where uh, you, you had a general procedure for getting strong convergence. And if I recall, I don't, I don't remember that having to do with best approximation as such, but it, it does reduce to the OGSO um, method. Um, so, but, but I, and I tried implementing, you know, again, just, just this general strong version of an algorithm and, and it it's, tends to be slower, even though we prefer strong convergence in infinite That's dimensions. Right. And, well, cause your goal, you know, if your goal is just to get a solution, right? Then, yeah. I mean, so, so the paper that Patrick and I wrote in, that came out in 2018, it has both the regular, it has both the regular version of this and the Ogazo version of this applied mm -hmm. to the in the same context. And we, we integrated it all, which, you know, made it very hard to one up us, but it also did make the, the paper rather dense, so. By the way, Russell, if you are uh, actually for another uh, Radu, right? We can see literally strong convergence versus weak convergence that usually doesn't do anything. So, and that is going back to, to the original Gershberg method, right? The, the way it was first implemented was optically, right? So roughly it was alternative projections. Mm -hmm. Okay. And had you alternate projection optically where you have like an optic, like an optic slab, right? You have a, you know, a diffraction slit. So give you for a transform, you truncate, you, uh, and then how you iterate at the end of the thing, you have a mirror that bounces back the light, does a second iteration, then another mirror. And at the speed of light, literally you iterate. Now, if you have affine spaces like in the uh, Gershberg uh, thing, then yeah, you did converge. But I bet you, if you had uh, a weekly conversion process, you would see it there and nothing happens. Right? The, the, uh, if you want, the energy of the error is not being reduced. Uh, so there are, you know, now this whole field of optical signal processing is coming back because it's cheaper than having, you know, like uh, digital hardware. There's also all the area of analog computing. Uh, which, uh, which is also still used in some applications. And more generally, the future of computing, we don't know what it is, right? So, uh, and, and also, even if you discrete stuff, but let's say for PDE, when you do that, you try to, to sample a process, which you know is infinite dimensional. And, and basically you want to know that the algorithm sampled give you the same limit point as the, your mesh is refined yeah. as the solution of the infinite dimensional problem. So you need some kind of background to infinite dimensional, right? So. But those are fascinating questions, right? How do we actually see or feel weak versus strong convergence? Because you talk to PD people, weak convergence, you might as well go fishing that day. Do anything for them, right? You, you yeah. don't reduce the, the energy of the error, right? So it's like, a, you know, and but most of there, our things are weakly convergent, unfortunately. Yeah. Right? But, but in their actual, I mean, when they actually discretize and start running, do they, with, did they notice the difference? No, but they want to know what their discretized method goes to. Yes. Okay. Right? And it has to match in the limit, the uh, limit of the infinite dimensional problem. Same thing in control, right? When you discretize control, there's, a, there's some kind of, you know, uh, underlying infinite dimensional process. And if you discretize and you don't know what, what's behind it, you, you just, you know, right. it's not clear what you're doing, right? So it's... Uh... So that, that could be an interesting uh, thing to think about. I mean, maybe people have, but that for stochastic programming, right? Because that sample of scenarios, right? Is, is presumably just a sample from some, some continuous model, right? Like yeah. both continuous in time and, and continuous in, in, you know, like weather or stock price or whatever, right? And indeed, I was talking to Terry uh, about this recently, I mean, before COVID, right? But there is actually an infinite uh, continuous time from process uh, behind a uh, policy aging. And people have studied only the discretized version, but there is a continuous version of it, right. which is fascinating. But I don't think anyone has really looked at it, right? Um, well, I mean, wouldn't Eddie's talk about, because it, it's just Douglas Radford, right? So. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or Schwing yeah. Yeah, yes. yeah, right. But I mean, it's, that, it's all, all special cases. So he had a, 
I believe he had a, a differential inclusion, which which mapped onto Douglas Ratchford, right? Yeah, but it's not exactly the same, right? I mean, there are many continuous processes that can be sampled down to what we know as DR, but the, right. the, the actual, uh, you know, stochasticity, which is sampled, you, you get uh, uh, this uh, the sample means, right? And run it completely in the, you know, in the continuous uh, omega space, if you want, that would be very fascinating, right? And um, I don't think anyone has looked at this, actually. Well, on the, or on the other end, going to... Um... Uh, in, infinite number of steps because there are different ways of yeah. going to the infinite dimensional space. But um... yeah, yeah. What, what what when we were talking about continuous time, what, what, is, is infinite number of steps? Is that what you're talking about, Patrick? Or are you talking about continuous? I thought I was talking the other way. I thought it was a, a, a continuum of, of of scenarios, right, Patrick? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And of course, you, you also have the steps, right? So you can go, uh, you know. In three dimensional, both in step size and in, uh, in scenarios, right? It's like, uh, yeah. Thank you. No, Patrick, I, I agree that uh, so there are interesting applications for, uh, okay, uh, which are able to highlight uh, strong convergence, but uh, one has to go, well, let's say, uh, beyond the five dimensional examples, one can see in many papers uh, just to illustrate, let's say, strong convergence. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, but this, so this kind of applications in PDEs, yeah, so this is something which is meaningful and this is probably one way to, to illustrate strong convergence versus weak convergence. Yes. But I mean, I would add that what, if you have an abstraction like this as the basis of your algorithm, if you have that available, it's easy to make these variations, you know? Mm -hmm. It's conceptual. I mean, maybe a lot of annoying algebra, but conceptually easy to 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 make the Ogozo version of this. Yes. Right. right. Okay. Yeah. So, thank you, Renan. Thank you for your nice talk, Jato. Thank you for nice discussion. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we will stop here. So, uh, yeah, we will post the, the video and the slides. Jato, is it correct on, on our website? So the, yeah. you, you okay. Yeah. So. That's uh, what you, Sure. Thank I'll you. send you the slides in like uh, 15 minutes or something. Great. Okay. okay. Then, uh, yeah, uh, I'd like to announce that uh, our next speaker will be Antonin Chambon next Monday. Wish you uh, a nice week. So uh, our seminar is, uh, yeah, will continue. And uh, yeah, it, it will end as soon as the uh, yeah, first, let's say, conferences yeah, <laughs> in, in person will take place. Be, you could be doing this a long time, Roger. No, 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 no. So, so I guess so. This, this will happen in May. We are optimistic. Okay. <laughs> okay. Have a nice week. Thank you very much.